Um, today's uh, uh, webinar is a rapid parametric design assessment for vibration sensitive floors. I am um, going now to hand over uh, to uh, David Koning, who will make introductions and start today's webinar. Brilliant. Thanks, Andrew. Um, and thanks to everybody who's joined us. We're really glad to have you with us. So I'm just going to introduce our team uh, and, and where we're calling in from today. So uh, my name is David and I am the head of structural products. And so I oversee the development of uh, Oasis GSA, AdSec and our various APIs and plugins, uh, of which we'll be speaking about the Grasshopper plugin uh, today. I'm joined uh, by some faces that you may know uh, if you've reached out for support uh, in these products in the past. So Peter Debney is uh, uh, the head of our customer support team and Karthik is one of our support managers. And just like you are calling in from all over the world, so are we. Uh, Peter is calling in from the UK, Karthik from India, and I am based in Montreal in Canada. So uh, before we launch into things, uh, we know that uh, the world of our tools is changing and that one of the most important things uh, for a structural engineer working on a big multidisciplinary design team, as we always are, is the ability to move our data around and communicate well uh, with the rest of our team. And so uh, a couple of years ago, uh, we started developing some Grasshopper plugins for our products so that you could run GSA, uh, you could run AdSec directly inside Rhino, directly inside Grasshopper. Uh, we're embedding uh, our core software, all of our software in there, and those have been rapidly uh, improving. You guys may have seen posts on uh, on LinkedIn uh, from Christian Nielsen, who spearheaded that development. Uh, he spoke a lot about it there. Um, and we're really excited today uh, to share how you can apply that um, to the specific problem of designing vibration sensitive floors. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Peter and uh, hope you enjoy the presentation. Great, thank you very much, David. OK, so what's the problem we're looking at? Um, vibration. Um, footfall vibration. Footfall, foot, footfall is human induced vibration and footfall analysis is the prediction of when a structure will be you know, um, how live the structure will be when people walk on it. Now, uh, the dangers of vibration and problems of vibration have been known for for a long time. Earthquake damage is perhaps a big one, but also things like wind-induced torsional failure of the Tacoma Narrows Bridge, very well known. These are, we you know, as ultimate limit state problems, things which will actually break the structure. Um, but over the last few decades, we've been we've had much greater understanding of serviceability limit state vibration, that which causes discomfort on, on offices or stairs or operational problems, such as in laboratories and, and hospitals. Uh, there have been a number of design guides um, to, to help us with, with, with the footfall problem. One of the first was the American Institute of Steel Construction, or AISC's guide, Floor Vibrations Due to Human Activity, published way back in 97. Since then, we've had further design guides published, Concrete Center's guide, CCIP 016, footfall um, joke reduced vibration of structures. Um, Steel Construction Institute, or the SCI, published several guides over the years, latest of which is the P354, Design of Floors for Vibration, a new approach. And the AIC then released an updated guide, um, which had learned from all the previous guides um, over the, um, released over the previous two decades. Footfall vibration has also started to be included in some design codes and manufacturers' recommendations, and I think this is a trend we will see continuing over uh, 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 over the years. Now, there are various approaches. Um, there are the simple methods, but dating back to the you know, starting starting point of vibration analysis before we had much FE. Um, where we do a simple approach and you take a standard floor plate, which is closest to what you've actually got in your structure. And we can use simple formulas to calculate the natural frequencies. Um, and then from that, you then get the velocities, accelerations and response values. Now, these have a lot of assumptions built into them, and it's very difficult to make them match up to the real structures. And they've also been shown to be quite unconservative or over conservative you never really know and they're basically very inaccurate in their results but 
they are a really good check for doing your um, when you run your GSA um, FE analysis um, uh, to make sure that yeah, uh, hand calculations and computer calculations match up or are close enough to, to, to tell you you've pr you've not many not many big mistakes. At least hopefully not. So all the modern guides recommend that you should use a finite element analysis approach for for calculating the footfall analysis. Now this requires the analysis of a subframe in the case of a floor um, or the entire structure in case of like a stair or a bridge and the first stage is to calculate all the vibration modes and, and and their frequencies, and this will be up to some cutoff point. Now, what that cutoff point is um, depends on which design guide you're using and the respective maximum uh, walking frequency and the fundamental frequency of the structure and so on. But generally, you know, 12 to 15 hertz or twice the fundamental frequency are typical values. Now, acceleration is the aspect we're most interested in for addressing people's comfort and it's their perception of vibration and whether it's a concern or not depends on what they're doing and their orientation. You know, if they're standing up, least sensitive. If they're lying down, they're most sensitive to, to floor vibrations. You'll also note from this graph on the right, the ISO base curve, the limit of human perception of vibration, that we are less sensitive to very low and very high frequencies, but most sensitive in this four to eight hertz range down here. Um, now, these are apparently the frequencies which our internal organs resonate at, and hence the reason why they can get a little bit uncomfortable. Downside is this is also the frequencies at which floor structures typically vibrate at as well, um, which means they need addressing. Now the response value um, is is a variation on the acceleration based on the base the ISO base curve of perception. You combine the two together, so response is essentially acceleration and the this response is not just a, de, um, dependent on the natural frequency of the floors but also the mass or more accurate the modal mass of each individual vi vibration mode um, and keeping it simple the modal mass is essentially the mass of the structure which is moving in that particular vibration mode and you can see a diagram here two different vi vibration modes which will each have their own um, fundamental frequency. Now, um, it's also good to know that large spans can are likely to have a low natural frequency, but they will also have quite a high modal mass, which to resist the footfall force, you know, force equals mass times acceleration, or acceleration equals force divided by mass. The force is the foot step, the mass is the mass of the each mode which is moving. So a low frequency floor can have a low response, but not necessarily. Because um, they can also resonate more. Similarly, a short span can have a high natural frequency, but they have a low modal mass, which means that resulting accelerations can be high. So a high frequency floor can have a high response, but again, not necessarily. Um, so I mentioned resonance just now. What is it? So a resonance is when the vibrations build up over time. Take this example here. There's the floor is vibrating with a particular frequency, and if that frequency is the same as as um, the footsteps of the person walking across, each foot footstep will push the floor more and more, increasing its amplitude and acceleration. A bit like pushing somebody on on, on a swing. Now, it's generally forbidden by the design codes um, um, by keeping the natural frequency of the floors up comfortably above walking frequencies. So what is more likely is the footsteps will interact and resonate with every other cycle of the floor, the second harmonic, which causes resonance there, or maybe with the third harmonic, maybe the third step, or indeed the fourth harmonic. Um, 
straight speaking, can be on that, but the effects get reduced and reduced with each harmonic, and it gets very difficult for people to actually be that constant at walking speeds um, for the higher harmonics, so we can ignore those. Um, now, I've also heard there's a fallacy. Um, you can that need to have multiple regular bays to build up a resonance. Now, this is not the case. Uh, vibrations over multiple bays tend to have a large modal mass, lowering the response. Um, though they do have more steps to build the response, it, it's a, a two-way thing. And in fact, isolated bays do not interact with the rest of the structure, tend to have a much higher response because they have a very low modal mass. Now, what can be important in these situations is, is the physical width of the modes. So how many steps can somebody um, take crossing over that sort of modal, that movement um, such? And um, there is an, um, certainly an option in GSA to vary the number of footfalls for each mode um, if, you need, if you need to fine tune your calculations or sharpen your pencil, as we used to say. Now, if this resonance was to go unchecked, it could induce vibrations which could damage or maybe even destroy the structure, a bit like to come in arrows. Unlikely. But because real structures have imperfections um, that absorb the vibration energy, this is what we call damping. Now, you may have heard the phrase critical damping in vibration engineering. This is the figure on, on um, this is the level of damping um, where the structure returns to its original position with the minimum amount of time after the dynamic movement or excitation. Uh, the more damping than this slows the return to the starting point. Um, less damping than this uh, means the structure will overshoot and thus oscillate. Now, most structures have a critical damp value not of 100%, but of 1 to four or five percent depending on the material and the construction um construction so all typical structures will will vibrate whenever they are excited now as well as transient responses um we also get um so we also resonant responses we also get transient responses or impulse responses um and now these tend to happen on high frequency structures typically you know above 10, 12 hertz uh, or so, where the vibrations die off before the next footfall lands. This means it's the first peak acceleration that we're interested in, um, and that's what's calculated, and damping has little effect on, on, on these results. But, but before we can analyze a model uh, to get the uh, response, we need to build it. And you need to note, first of all, there are differences to a, mo a standard static model. So first of all, you need to model both the slabs and the beams. The mesh density needs to be sufficiently high to get accurate results. So typically eight to ten nodes along, along a, a beam span. And also the strains are very small with footfall vibration, which means we can model shear connections or pin connections as if they were moment connections. Similarly, uh, we would typically offset the beams and slabs to generate composite action, even if the beams were not designed for composites in the ultimate limit state. So, you, so that that you know, friction between 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 the components is 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 very helpful for 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 reducing the vibrations. And also, unlike static analysis, with the footfall, the cladding restrains the floor rather than the other way around. Uh, this means that we need to add vertical restraints on wall lines, plus sufficient lateral re restraints to stop any significant horizontal movements without over stiffening the model. Now, the American guide, um, Design Guide 11, takes a slightly different approach to the other guides and recommends you explicitly model the composite section of each beam. Now, this does allow greater control over stiffnesses and maybe allow increased stiffness on the edge beams, and you don't have to worry so much about whether neutral axis is because that's, that's um, handled automatically, but you do need to calculate lots of variance on each section size in your model. And also, do watch out for self-weight or the mass, because um, otherwise the slab aspects and so on will be added in twice 
and you do not want to overestimate the mass because that will underestimate the response. Usually. Um, Design Guide 11 also recommends you add springs that represent the walls uh, and cladding rather than a full restraint. And yeah, so you can include the stiffnesses of the partitions on the floors as nodal spring stiffnesses, or you can explicitly include them um, as shell or plain stress elements. Alternatively, you can just place pins in place. Each design guide has its own particular recommendations. Now, it is always good to include the columns. These do add stiffnesses to the floor. Um, now we've got a choice here. You can either model them as full height to the next floor and fix the ends, or half height and pin the ends. Um, whichever is more appropriate. I mean, each has their advantage, disadvantage. Um, now, no, you don't need to include multiple floors unless you definitely expect sharing of vibration be between the floors. And loading, um, you need the minimum credible dead load. This is not ultimate limit state. We want the least load that's going to be on there. That is the conservative case. And the recommended live loads, um, typically 10% of the live loads. And these loads are then converted into mass, which resists acceleration. So low mass um, is, is the more conservative approach. We also need to model the slab properties. And we have a couple of options. Um, first, assume isotropic behavior, nice and simple. Model the slab full thickness. Use a property wizard to start the properties based on the profile decking. Um, and we can use a standard um, material or indeed a dynamic concrete material um, for this. The code typically recommends a higher Young's modulus, um, though future guys may be recommending a multiplier on the particular grades Young's modulus. Um, hasn't quite come through yet, but that's likely where things are going. Second option is to model the orthotropic behavior of the slab. So if you've got a slab on profile metal decking, it's much stiffer in the span direction than the other. So here we want to model um, just the solid part of the slab above the decking, um, ensuring that's the correct offset. Um, and in the property table, we give an orthotropic material, which increases the stiffness in one direction to account for the missing structure. And we can calculate the effective stiffness in the slab span direction. We can use the formulas, which comes from the SCI guide, um, to give us the increased Young modulus to compensate for the missing slab depth. So how do we put this to practice? Um, at this point, I'll pass over to Karthik, who will show us how to analyze a floor for footfall response with GSA and using our, our Grasshopper plugin. Thank you, Peter. Let me share my screen to proceed further. Right, I welcome you all to this footfall webinar. Um, I'm happy to continue with Grasshopper plugin related information. Right, so the Grasshopper plugin for GSA will run GSA inside Grasshopper using GSA's latest .NET API, which is very fast compared with previous versions of GSA APIs. GSA plugin embeds the core GSA solver inside the Grasshopper as opposed to linking them externally, making it the fastest professional fine element analysis solver inside the Grasshopper for structural engineers. Uh, you could define any cross section you could possibly think of. Every input will be mapped to the right units. Standard catalogs of steel sections from across the globe are also accessible within Grasshopper environment. And you don't need to worry about intersections between beams, slabs, points, or anything. Our super fast measure, sorry for that. Yeah, our super fast measure will solve for any intersections between any kinds of objects for you. You just draw the structural members like 1D um, beams, two dimensional slabs, or 3D members. The measure will intersect for you. And uh, you can work with existing GSA models as well, and you can extract geometries, sections, materials, analysis cases from it, and extend your models in Grasshopper. You could also save models that you 
created from scratch in Grasshopper and open them in Gross GSA desktop and share it with your team members. And with that overview, let's see how the model shown here can be created in Grasshopper. Regarding installing Grasshopper plugin uh, in Rhino, uh, you can refer to our documentation page. I will show it to you in a while. Let me bring that window. And share it back. Right, so those who have used uh, GSA before uh, can access the uh, know, know how how to. How to check the documentation page that is uh, under the help menu and when you click on the tutorials uh, that will lead you to the documentation page where you can see how the plugin can be installed on your machine and once the grasshopper plugin is installed successfully you could see a gsa tab in the grasshopper main window the gsa tab here contains many tabs and each tab has been aligned with similar to how the commands are uh, arranged in the user uh, the uh, gsa desktop version Starting with the model, the model tab contains many components for uh, creating the geometry and opening the existing file and uh, other relevant information from the existing geometries. And uh, considering the properties, which has got many uh, components for uh, creating the materials and defining cross sectional prof profiles, that includes the 1D member profiles. 2D member profiles and so on. For example, let me introduce the material create material component. And this has got a drop down from which I can select what material I would like to in introduce uh, for for my analysis. And uh, uh, soon after I select the respective materials, I'm having an option further option to choose the grade and so on. Under the geometry menu, uh, you could choose a component components for creating one dimensional members, two dimensional members and three dimensional members. And likewise, you can also create elements from members using the create elements from members component. Those who have used GSA before would understand what is member and what is element. And uh, uh, next we have got the loads tab, which contains various components for generating the loads that includes nodal loads, beam loads and um, surface loads, grid area loads and so on. And under the analysis uh, tab, we can find a component for uh, doing the analysis and creating combination cases. The results tab contains various components for displaying the text output of the results within the grasshopper environment. That includes nodal uh, reactions, nodal displacements, considering the 2D uh, elements, we can extract the 2D stresses, strains and so on. And display components contains uh, display menu contains various components to display the results within the Rhino environment in the graphic window. And without further ado, let me jump into the pre predefined Grasshopper script for demonstration demonstrating. Like this uh, piece of script collects information from you, like the uh, span details, span length and width, and number of base in the X and Y direction, and the column dimension. I have selected a column dimension of 250 millimeter uh, square, and this can be varied at any point of time. So with this basic geometric input, I am creating the rectangular grid, and I'm pushing the rectangular grid, grid nodes at top and bottom with the floor height so that I can create the columns. So I have defined several other components to post process the input data to create columns. And here let me switch on the uh, enable the views one after the other for a better clarity. And the using the member one D component, I'm creating the columns with the input data available and I'm creating beams 
with the same co component, but with a different set of results. And I assume that the slab is going to have post tension slab and the post tension slab is going to be created from member 2D component for which the B rep is the main input, which is taken from the grid that we have defined in this case. Right, let, let me enable the component as well for a preview. Yes, now the geometry is ready with slabs and beams and uh, columns. Coming to the thickness part, the concrete set center guide provides guidelines to calculate the thickness. So I am parameterizing the thickness of the slab using a Python script. Let me open the script. So this script has been uh, written for calculating the thickness using the slab by uh, thickness ratio of 40, whereas the 35 is the minimum cover that needs to be given for uh, the concrete slab. And also I'm incorporating another criteria for uh, uh, checking the slab thickness. According to the concrete center guide, the minimum thickness of the slab should be 10 mil 100 millimeters uh, when, when we consider the fire resistance of the building. Assuming these factors, I'm creating um, another component uh, to pick the values, and that is 285 millimeters, the slab thickness. I'm feeding this thickness back to the pretension slab and that has been bring that has been brought to the geometry. And now uh, I'm I'm here to provide the support. The column ends have been extended till the next floor level and th th they have been fixed. And also the edges of the slab is going to be pinned. Right, this is not enabled. Let me enable that as well. Right. So with this information, I'm ready with uh, the geometry to do the analysis. Let me apply some loads. So I have applied a couple of loads here. The default load is uh, the self weight of the structure under the load case one under the load type as dead load. And I'm applying another uh, load as live load. Uh, that is 2.5 kilopascal on the 2D shell elements. With this, uh, I'm ready with creating the analysis component and feed in all the geometric properties, load properties for doing the analysis. So you, you know well that uh, GSAGH has got a component for doing the static analysis, whereas the footfall analysis is uh, quite comprehensive and that needs a lot of other parameters to be involved. So the footfall analysis has to be defined in a separate file. We call it seed file from which we can bring the case details to this script. Let me open the seed file. So the, the seed file does not have any information um, except the model analysis uh, parameters and footfall analysis task. So from the model analysis, we get the model required number of modes. In this case, I have set 10 number of modes and uh, I'm taking 10% of the live load for uh, calculating the mod model frequencies. And the footfall analysis task contains various parameters uh, like uh, excitation method and model analysis task to be considered and so on. After we successfully define the task here, uh, I'm seeding it in the analysis menu. Once I seed it, the analysis is already run and we, we are ready with uh, the analysis results. We can see the results one after the other. So as we've seen uh, in the seed model, there are 11 analysis cases cases uh, A1 to A10 is for uh, model analysis, which gives the mode shape and relevant information for the footfall analysis to run. A11 is the footfall analysis. And within the gross upper environment, I can see the uh, results um, for which I can extract. I can use the component called footfall, which is uh, available under the GSA menu. And uh, I can also choose what type of uh, re response I, I would like to see. Uh, for extracting the text output. In this case, this is resonance. And if I change it to transient, I would be able to see the uh, corresponding results. And now uh, these results are um, stored in the uh, file, which can be ex exported to the GSA desktop version. So before that, let me show how you can parametrically control the geometry. So in this case, uh, these are the basic parameters that uh, the, the values have been taken from the user and thickness and other parameters have been calculated by the 
grasshopper plugin using various components and uh, uh, i have a, a privilege to change the dimensions let's say the dimension is um 6 meters uh, in in the the span the expand length is 6 meters and you will be able to see the change in the geometry and also we will be able to plot the results in the uh, rhino environment let me switch off the 2D slab that is over overwriting the contours right and now I will switch on the contours contours on the 2D elements right so this again got um, a drop down list and from which i can choose what type of uh, response i want to display in the graphic view and from transient to uh, resonance resonance to transient we will be able to change it and for any other changes uh, within the uh, geometry we will be able to see the results instantaneously the program is analyzing uh, the model instantaneously and gives the results right um, let me change the number of pairs from three to four uh, in the x direction and the number of base uh, from three to six in the y direction so this takes a while to update the geometry and further do the analysis uh, with this we'll be able to get the output in the graphic view as well as in the um, text output view so i grab those output panes here just to see how the results are varying and so that uh, that gives me a, a clarity of uh, the expected results for each and every change i'm making it here right so let me reset back to um, three by three and export right so with this uh, information uh, i'll i can export the uh, gsa file to the desktop version so that this can be reviewed in uh, in, in the desktop version right so i have chosen a path in the onedrive and shared that folder with my uh, team member this can be instantaneously accessed by my team member let me save the file and see yeah, the file has already been created and now I will hand over the session back to Peter for reviewing the results. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you much, Karthik. All right, let's have a look, see what we've got. Let me share my screen, bring this model in. Um, so there is the file, just, just create, let me download that. And and open it up. So, um, so here is that model um, fresh from Grasshopper. And what have we got in here? Um, so, um, so we can see the um, the footfall results. Um, maximum resonance results, maximum transient results, and indeed the maximum and the maximum, you know, but worth, worth of both. Um, also note that, yeah, these contour results, it's not the full picture, there is more, because um, what, what we're actually calculating is not 2D results, but 1D results. Um, these footfall calculations are done on on a node by node basis and 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 that's the results we get back and then because we got results at all four corners of these 2d elements we can then produce nice contours which are much easier for for clients and so on uh, to 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 look at now apart from transient apart from response factors we've also got uh velocities and accelerations um and so on as as is appropriate you know different guides require slightly different things um laboratories you've got to look at the velocities for example the, or the rms velocities um now um so we've got got the contours we also need to look at we can look at tabular data um 
but if we look at node results, um, let's say look at the resonance and we can see um, all those. Let me just select, select some suitable nodes like those ones there. Um, um, and we can see the results or indeed we can go, well, let's just go show me the summary of the summary for all. What, where's the worst results here? So I can see node 267 um, has got the worst resident results and node 1316 has the worst transient results. So where's 2067? Um, go back to here, put it back to overall response, uh, find Two six seven. Um, that's spot in the middle. Hey, where the biggest contour is. Surprise, surprise. Um, what can we do with this? Value well, we can drill down further to understand what exactly is happening at that point. And for that, we have the chart views. Let's look at the modal analysis. Um, and here we can look at so this two zero six seven. And uh, we can look at the resident and transient re results. And um, in this instance, I think the most interesting ones are maybe the resident response factor, um, and maybe the participation, the participation factors for the modes. Let's open those up. So first of all, um, the vibrations at that point. So the, the peak point we are seeing um, is this one up here. Um, so what we'll be seeing is um, the walking frequency against the response value and how the responses resonate with particular walking speeds. And this particular walking speed is closer than nearby. We can see it's at um, 2.3 hertz um, and it's given response value of 3.7. Um, and there's a couple of lower peaks down here. Now, this... Um, this is set up using the concrete center guides, so that gives walking speeds between 1 and 2.5 hertz. But 2.5 hertz is quite fast for a floor and good for a corridor, maybe not appropriate for a room. And, and so you may say, well, for the use of the building in this situation, um, 2.5 isn't too much. And the guide can say, well, you can, you can use a lower walking speed. Alternatively, the SCI guides, P354, suggest taking the walking speeds between 1.8 and 2.2 hertz. So in this, between 1.8 and 2.2, you will find not a response value of 3.7, but this point here, um, 2.5. Um, so you, you get a natural drop in the resonance um, through using a different range of walking frequencies. Um, but of course, if the peak was happening at two hertz, then um, it would make little uh, difference. Um, curious thing as well, though, if you are using a restricted range of walking frequencies, let's say 1.8 to 2.2, you think response is a bit high, I'll put a bit more mass in, which lowers the natural frequency, but increases results, which will, that will then move this peak to the left. And we might end up actually going up this peak and basically you can increase the response by increasing mass because you've hidden these peaks outside the walking range and so anyway um thing about gsa is we'd like to give the information to understand where the results are coming from um so you as the engineer can make fully informed decisions so similarly uh, the second chart in this instance um we can see that the results at this mode uh node resulted to from mode three in the main and a little bit from mode one and a tiny amount from mode seven and mode nine but we can do so um let's say the response value is too high we don't want to add more mass might be existing structure how can we deal with mode three let's jump back to the graphic uh let's go and look at mode three and look at the shape and also i'll look at the contours on the 2D displacements. And we can see, um, yeah, so this is the, the vibration middle. How might we deal with the vibration at that point? It's a big bay. Um, yeah, put the beam in, put the support in, um, put the big plant pot smack in the middle where, where so people can't, can't walk there and you can put a bit of extra mass. 
various options. But anyway, um, this information that you can use to work out your design and then test that design um, to, 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 to see how it works. And at that point, um, I will hand back to David and say, um, do we have any questions? Thank you, Peter, and thank you, Karthik. That was a really great uh, overview of what we can do. So, uh, yeah, I just want to pull out a couple of themes uh, from the presentation. You know, first one being collaboration. Uh, our parametric tools are deeply integrated with the desktop product. Uh, so here, Peter's been playing the role of the engineer who's less familiar with parametric uh, tools and the modern way of working, but very familiar with the technical problem. And Karthik's been playing the role of the uh, very excited a uh, young engineer in the office who wants to use Grasshopper, and you can see the collaboration is seamless. Um, the models were able to be accessed and interrogated uh, and looked at by everyone on the team. Uh, and the second one, you know, Peter made reference to these heuristics. Heuristics are fast, but they're not detailed. We no longer really need to make a choice uh, today in 2024 between a rapid heuristic and a slow detailed analysis. Um, so, um, the you know with 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 Grasshopper you're able to do a detailed uh, detailed assessments uh, quickly of, of your models and then finally the last one is very important value to us at Oasis is transparency and uh, this is not software that says yes you're good to go this is software that as Peter said gives you the tools you need to communicate trade offs with your clients to discuss creative solutions uh, with the other disciplines you're working with and to really understand how the behavior uh, uh, how, how your structure is behaving. So with that, now let's uh, let's turn to the question. So the first question, I think this one's for you, Peter, is the modal mass here different from effective mass? This was this came up early in your in the first part of your presentation. One is dynamic characteristic of the floor. Another telling you how much the mode, how much mass participates in the mode. That's more effective mass, less acceleration. Yeah, because each mode, each vibration, natural frequency is only vibrating part of of, of the structure. Um, and within those modes, some parts are moving lots, some parts are moving little, and basically it's only the amount of structure which is moving for that particular frequency would resist the excitation at that frequency. So part of the output for the modal analysis is the modal mass of each bit. And that's what we use for calculating. If we use to calculate the total mass of the floor, we will be underestimating um, the responses enormously. So it's it's just that more accurate uh, approach. Brilliant. Uh, the next question is, why should we model shear connections as moment connections? And, and I can take mm. this one. This is one of the joys of life where um, you know, that's the joke that engineers will approximate a horse as a solid sphere. Um, but sometimes, you know, real life leaks through our abstractions. And so what happens is a shear connection is actually bolted with a, some stress and it doesn't become a pin until there's a certain amount of load and it slips. And under footfall conditions, that slip does not occur. So because the, the, the displacements are very small, that, that connection is bolted, is fixed, and they're effectively acting under those small displacements as a moment connection. Um, the next question is, can you explain the difference between members and elements? So this is some GSA specific terminology. Uh, you saw Peter switch layers and the model appeared. We have a design mm -hmm. layer, which is one model inside of GSA that is an analogous to a bin model. So you're modeling entire members. You have your slab, you have your beams, you have your columns. Mm -hmm. And then when you switch to the analysis layer, that's a finite element analysis model. And we have elements. And so the elements are the actual layers of computation and GSA takes care of meshing that for you. And if you say I want a finer mesh, you change one parameter, remeshes the whole thing. You can apply all your loads in the design layer. They'll get applied across. You can um, create uh, all your load cases. So if you if you had a doubt about whether your mesh was fine enough, you know, within GSA, either in Grasshopper or in GSA, you just increase, you just refine the mesh and rerun. Uh, and everything's there. And so members and elements are the, the terminology we use uh, for that. Is the parametric ability only possible if you build the model from scratch and run it, or can you par parameter parameterize the design with an existing model? Um, so in a sense, 
because we have a seed model. The example we showed today was parameterizing an existing model. The way Grasshopper works is every component makes a copy of the data as it goes through. So it's just copying the data all the way through. So you can absolutely open a pre-existing model that actually has geometry and properties and loads, not just analysis tasks, extract the properties, extract the geometry, change them, move them, uh, and then save it out as another one. So if you're saying, well, I've got a model ready to go, uh, but I really wanna tweak a little bit of the geometry, I wanna make some changes, um, yeah, that's absolutely uh, absolutely possible. Uh, you probably won't be adding bays and all that. That's the that's the type of parameterization that's very useful to do from the very beginning. But if you have an existing model and you're looking to shift floors up and down, or you're trying to to vary some, uh, you want to do a stochastic analysis with with multiple input parameters. Yes, that's absolutely something you can do. Uh, our next question is, would you typically model full height partitions as pinned line supports as well? I think this one's for you, Peter. Yeah, um, it depends on the partition, really. Um, it's yeah, a block work part partition, definitely. Um, a lightweight stud partition, possibly, or might express, yeah, it's value judgments, engineering judgments. Um, also, of course, if it's a lightweight partition, it might move around. How sure can you be that the partition can remain? The answer is, <laughs> it's up to you. Um, um, check to see what's likely. Add it in, leave it out. What difference does it make? Um, what is the risk of it of, of it moving? How sensitive is the floor plate to modeling it in? Um, that's, yes, that's not really the answer you're looking for, uh, but the answer is, Decide <laughs> and and see and, and, and see what happens. And, and also in Grasshopper, you can easily turn it on and off. Mm. Right, you can you can take that and model it as one way or the other. So very much so. Good. Yeah, I mean, well, one thing I know Karthik did show us was the, he's got a switch in that model to switch the beams on and off. Exactly. That's what difference it makes. Uh, if we want to use a tuned mass damper, how do we decide its location? So that I think is the next level beyond this. What we're presenting today, we're just looking at uh, a floor without a tuned mass damper. But I do know the general principle is you want to place them somewhere where you have a lot of displacement. So again, starting from your modal analysis, looking at um, which parts of the floor are most active. Uh, these are the ones that that you'll want to target. And uh, you know, in that case, um, you know, finding someone with knowledge of tune mass dampers because it's not just uh, you know where to place it but also how to specify it and procure it uh, can be a bit tricky. Uh, the next question is can we have the grasshopper codes? I presume that's the grasshopper files uh, in the presentation. So I will just drop in the chat. Um, we may have uh, seen this before but it's a link to the grasshopper tutorials on our website where we have a number of grasshopper files you can download. Um, and uh, Karthik and Peter and I will discuss about adding mm -hmm. uh, this example uh, onto there where you you'll be able to find it there. Mm -hmm. So that is uh, that is great. Uh, next question, the transient results to be a product of the footfall analysis. How can we input transient loads like a gym weight? Peter. OK, so uh, apart from the footfall analysis, which is for individuals walking around, um, there's two choices for a, a gym. Uh, one is a um, there's three choices. So you can have a harmonic load, so you can apply the load of the people um, over an area and have that varying um, sinusoidally in time with the you know, dance class or or, or, or whatever. Um, you can you can take that load and apply a time history um, to it, um, which is perhaps more suitable for instantaneous results. Like a stadium, you know, um, the, your team scores, everyone leaps to their feet. You get that big impact, and and the structure vibrates, and you can use a time history for that. Um, and there's also a um, multimodal um, harmonic analysis where you're looking at multiple modes simultaneously, which is actually what the footfall analysis is doing is automating for you. So um, yeah, we've actually got three main choices. I would go for a harmonic or a time history in general for I think for that sort of situation. Brilliant. Uh, the next question is, does Grasshopper 
actually calculate the full FE analysis or does it rely on a response surface approach? So the Grasshopper plugin is actually open source. If you go search on GitHub for Oasis uh, GSA Grasshopper, you can see the full uh, the full source of, of, of those plugins. And the reason we can do that is because there's actually nothing happening inside that source code. It is passing off the um, the model and everything to GSA and it is running GSA inside of Rhino. You know, you think of the old Intel inside stickers that used to come on uh, on laptops. Now it's GSA inside, uh, sitting inside Rhino. So um, yes, it's doing a full finite element analysis. That's the long way to answer your question. Uh, the analysis, if you open that file in GSA and delete results and rerun the analysis, it is the exact same analysis that is being run uh, in Grasshopper. It's not a an alternative product. It's really a, a plugin and a way of accessing that. And also, in addition to that, so, so we've got GSA inside Grasshopper and Grasshopper inside Rhino, but you can also have Grasshopper inside Revit. So you can run GSA directly inside Re Revit using the Grasshopper plugins as well. Yeah, it's a, it's a wonderful world we live in. <laughs> so uh, the next question is, can we model multiple 2D elements, one on top of the other, such as a concrete screed over a CLT slab for additional stiffnesses? Uh, the answer is yes. So I spoke about the design layer and the analysis layer. Um, right at the moment, you wouldn't be able to easily model two slabs, one over the other in the uh, the design layer. And that's because the way the design layer works is you can, when you have two slabs on top of each other, we just pick the thickest one to generate the analysis model. But once you generated the analysis model, uh, you can go ahead and definitely overlay as many elements as you want. You have full control of the analysis model. There's no magic. There's no, uh, there's no, uh, there's no clippy who thinks it knows better than you. Uh, you have full control over the analysis model. And again, if you're in um, if you're in Grasshopper, you have that you have that parametric high level view. You can generate the mesh. You can overlay those. So uh, yes, uh, you can absolutely uh, do that. And depending on um, on your model, you know it may be enough to just model the additional mass of the screed. Again, that's fairly easy. But uh, yes, you have those options. Uh, sorry, a bunch of questions came in. Here we go. Can a timber floor with primary and secondary beams uh, be analyzed? Uh, yes. Oh, yes. That's correct. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, we have a, a number of customers doing just that. And of course, timber floors, more damping, but not much mass. So they, they, they can be quite lively. So there's um, it's, it's very important for timber structures. For the response spectrum, excitation method. Can you explain what full excitation means and a high level description of how the contour plot is generated? Thank you, um, you, Peter. Yeah, so uh, oh, let me call back the list if I um, share my screen so I can remember all the, all the correct terms. So um, in the footfall analysis, go on, come on, wait. The team is getting the way. Right, okay, footfall analysis. Um, so self excitation that is exciting each node so the excitation of each node is as if the person is walking um and we model node by node because based on how the experimentation data is done and then adjusted to take into account the movement but anyway self excitation is you excite each node in turn and model the response just at that node so excite node one measure response node one so to no two motion response no two and so on this is the very quick approach and this will generally give you the maximum results but it doesn't give you the full picture so a full excitation will again go around each node individually and excite it but then measure the response at all other nodes um now the Full excitation rigorous is the gold standard. Um, if you're sort of making sure the model works, and sometimes big models can be quite slow, you might do the fast excitation option, which just takes a few shortcuts, reduce the accuracy a little bit, but you can say, yeah, I can see that working. But then for the for the deliver results, use full excitation rigorous. Now, where for that, where the rigorous or full excitation really comes into its own is when you're looking at the effects of one area on another. Uh, so, for example, um, you've got an operating theatre 
um, very sensitive to vibration. You don't want the floors and lights to be bouncing around when you're doing brain surgery. Um, within the operating theatre, people move slowly, but there could be a corridor outside where people are running past with trolleys and goodness knows what else. Um, the full excitation with it will allow you to measure the response in the operating theatre of people moving fast in the in the adjacent corridor. Um, so obviously, full excitation is a much slower analysis. So self excitation seconds, full excitation maybe a minute or two, rigorous. Big models might be time to go for lunch. Um, it all depends. I mean, model this size, um, you wouldn't see much difference between full and um, self, but um, a full size model uh, floor plate. Yeah, you, you might see, see some difference in analysis time. But full excitation is 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 the full analysis. Brilliant, and um, I think we've got just time for uh, two further questions, and I'll just ask them both, Peter, and you can mm -hmm. uh, jump in. So one is uh, we have a question: Output results rely on input properties of member and mesh stiffness in order to minimize the error. Um, is there a differential limit between the longitudinal and transverse stiffness to avoid spurious results? And the second one is, can we carry out a steady state analysis? Well, the steady state analysis is, well, the modal analysis is a steady state analysis. Um, mm -hmm. And um, and the harmonic analysis on that is a steady state response analysis. So yes. Um, Minimizing the um, minimizing the error in the elements. Um, the yeah, the, the better shaped the elements are, um, the better. Keep more square, me, most accurate. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, modeling, yeah, accuracy of the model. How accurate can you make the model? Um, you know, accuracy and precision is a big subject. In fact, uh, we um, it, uh, myself and other team members published a paper on it. Was it early this year, last year, um, on accuracy, accuracy and precision in FE models um, and the limits on that. Um, and um, we're happy to, to, to share a link to that. Um, in fact, we could share a copy as well. We could share a copy. Um, it's it's, it's Astro Team. Yeah. Astro team. yeah. Um, it, it was published in Trust Engineer uh, a little while ago. Yeah, and in general, uh, you know, GSA has the analysis layer the analysis model fully open for interrogation and modification. So um, we tend not to put limits on what you can put in in the analysis model. Uh, so yeah, there are opportunities to shoot yourself in the foot. Uh, that's true. But on the other hand, you know, with the grasshopper tools, if you're not sure are we getting weird results is what's going on, it makes it very, very easy to parameterize your analysis and to see how um, a particular parameter is changing. You know, if, if I if I change the longitudinal to transfer stiffness ratio, am I getting fair, a stable and predictable response, or is it jumping all over the place? So, um, you know, we're, we're we're providing the tools for for everyone as a structural engineer to understand their structures and understand their analysis. Yeah, and brilliant. And, and um, I've, I've been working with the model for a long time. I know if you if your results are coming back weird or strange you've probably made a mistake somewhere in in the units or in the case of um, a colleague of mine um he put in a 150 thick uh, steel floor rather than a concrete one and that'll make a difference value, yep huge difference yep. <laughs> didn't yep. move at all good well with that i will say i think I think I'm wrapping things up. So thanks, everybody. Thank you for joining us. We hope this has been uh, informative. And if you are using GSA or are interested, if you're interested in trying out GSA, please reach out to Andrew. And if you are using GSA and you have questions about your model, please reach out to our support team and you will likely be speaking to Peter or Karthik directly. And uh, they'll be answering your questions just as they have today. So thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you. Everyone for thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. bye.